Welcome to another episode of The Brand Called You, a podcast and podcast show that brings you leadership lessons, knowledge, experience, and wisdom from thousands of successful individuals from around the world. I'm your host, Ashutosh Garg, and today I'm privileged to welcome a very senior, accomplished, and respected professional from Barbade Barbuda's uh, Ambassador Joan H. Underwood. Uh, Joan, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. I appreciate the invitation and the opportunity to speak with you and your audience. Thank you. Um, Ambassador Underwood is the Managing Director of and Principal Consultant of UTDS Incorporated. She served as the Chief Implementation Officer in the Office of the Prime Minister, Dr. The Honorable Winston Baldwin Spencer. Uh, she was or is an, an Antigua, Antigua and Barbu, Barbuda's non-resident ambassador. She's an author, and all of you know I'm always very partial to authors. She's an author of a book titled Manager's First Aid Kit, A Practical Guide to Remedy the Three Most Common Managerial Challenges. So, uh, Joan, today we're going to focus more on your human resources knowledge and less on your avatar as an ambassador. But tell me a little bit about your own amazing journey and how did you first become involved in the field of human resources? My HR origin story is not one of intention, but one of circumstance. Mm -hmm. I had worked previously as a general manager, as a project manager, and a financial conglomerate mm -hmm. for which I had managed a project. Once the project was completed, they presented me with a proposal to join the organization and set up an HR department. Prior mm -hmm. to that, they only had a personnel right. department. Hmm. At the time, I had less than zero interest in HR. Mm -hmm. However, I do like startups. So I saw it as a challenge and I negotiated that I would accept the offer if they combined it with strategic development. Okay. And they did. I told them I would have held the role for three years before moving on. Nine years later, I was still in that position. So <laughs> I fell in love with HR mm -hmm. because someone else saw my capacity to work in that field. Oh, wonderful. So tell me, what in your view are some of the key skills and qualities that HR professionals should possess to thrive in today's dynamic environment? Great question. And from my experience, I would say we can narrow it down to three things. Mm -hmm. We need to be able to learn, to change, and to grow. Mm -hmm. Because the environment within which we operate is so dynamic. Mm -hmm. The volatility, the uncertainty, the complexity, the ambiguity, the VUCA, environment. Mm -hmm. And my experience is that rather than having a fixed set of competencies, mm -hmm. what we need is the agility, the adaptability, the ability to learn while doing, the ability mm -hmm. to change, and the ability to ourselves grow mm -hmm. as we seek to help the organizations that we serve. Mm -hmm. Thank you. And Based on all the years of experience that you have in HR, what in your view are some common challenges that organizations in the Caribbean face when it comes to HR and how do they overcome these challenges? Hmm. How do they overcome? Wow, that, that's the, the big question. Mm -hmm. I think our primary challenge relates to the fact that HR within the region has not yet been acknowledged as a strategic business partner. Mm -hmm. So when we look at the C-suite for many of the entities that operate within the Caribbean, of course, you're going to find your chief financial officer, your CFO, because everybody's paying attention to the money. Mm -hmm. Marketing is probably at the table as well, because you're paying attention to your products and to mm -hmm. your customer base. It is far less common to mm -hmm. see HR at that table. Mm -hmm. And so I think in order to overcome that challenge, we as HR practitioners need to be able to show that we understand the business. Mm -hmm. Because in that C-suite, they're making big decisions about the business. 
about the strategy, about how it's going to either attain or maintain its competitive advantage. Mm. And if we can't speak the language of business, then can we really have a legitimate expectation that we're going to be invited to the table where those decisions are made? So mm. I think the way for us to overcome the challenge is to um, take the time for us to understand before we seek to be understood, because that's something that, you know, it's a weakness that we have. Hmm. And it's something we need to address because we go in thinking we have answers to give them. They should listen. Hmm. But I say, let's start by listening so that we understand. And once we understand the business, understand the business strategy, then we can talk to our, our partners in the C-suite about how we can bring the people along hmm. in order to help them execute successfully on the strategy. So Great seek response. first to understand, then to be understood. Mm -hmm. Great response, Sean. Thank you. My next question is that how or what role do you see HR playing in addressing diversity, equity, and inclusion in the workplace? And how can HR help to foster an inclusive culture? Okay. I think we are strategically and exquisitely positioned to have an impact here. Because at the end of the day, DEI is about people and having people not just feel tolerated, mm -hmm. but feel genuinely valued and accepted within the environment. Mm -hmm. And I would suggest to you that there are two levers that mm -hmm. HR can do to accomplish this. In the first instance, our, we have a, a considerable responsibility when it comes to recruitment and selection. Mm -hmm. And so when we are recruiting and selecting individuals to come into the organization, it's important for us to ensure that we're bringing that diversity to mm -hmm. the table, mm -hmm. that we're not just bringing in people who are, are the same, but that we're looking to see are the organizations that we as HR practitioners serve, do mm. they look like the populations whom we serve? Mm. So when our customers, when our external stakeholders look at us, do they see themselves? So in recruitment and selection, HR has a pivotal role to play. Mm. The second leverage point that I think we have is that with our responsibility for talent development, we are grooming the leaders within mm. these organizations. Hmm. So in our leadership development programming, are we ensuring that our leaders truly understand, appreciate, and embrace the importance of diversity, equity, and inclusion? Fascinating. And, you know, as a, as a very senior leader yourself, you must have started some time back. What challenges did you have to overcome as a woman leader in your career? And what advice do you have for aspiring women leaders? Well, it really is more difficult for us as women to, first of all, attain the leadership um, levels within our organizations and then to perform in a way that engenders the confidence of those not just those that we lead, but external stakeholders. Hmm. And one of the primary challenges that I've had to navigate is to unlearn some of the things that I learned as a young girl coming. Hmm. Okay. So girls were to be seen and not heard and sugar and spice and everything hmm. nice. That's what little girls are made of. For us to be able to become leaders and to excel as leaders, we have to be deconditioned from some of those old norms and beliefs. And uh, you know, it, there's a saying, what got you here won't get you there. Mm. So while that socialization may have served us as we were growing up, if we aspire to leadership, one of the things that we, we need to debunk and, and to reject is that, oh, you shouldn't you know, talk about yourself. Just, just do good work, people mm. will see it and they will reward you. Mm. Actually, that's mm. not how it works. With your background, you know that it's important for you to be your own best advocate Correct. if you aspire to be a leader. Mm. Another thing that we were taught uh, in terms of relationships, women are pretty good at developing relationships, mm. 
but we are not good at um, deploying those relationships to help us to advance. Mm -hmm. So guys are much better at, if they need something, they will ask someone to provide them with an introduction to give, help them get access to resources, including others who are in decision-making um, mm -hmm. positions. Women, we, we feel that that's kind of icky to be asking your friends to do mm -hmm. things for you. Mm -hmm. And that's something we need to get over. Right. Networking is important and deploying your network to help you achieve your goals. There's absolutely nothing mm -hmm. wrong with that. We also need to, you know, in the region, we say we small up ourselves. Mm. So we try and diminish our, our contribution. So we use a lot of we and instead of claiming what we, I was able to, I succeeded in. So we tend to use language that creates the impression that we're good in terms of the supporting role but not in terms of the lead role. So those are some of the things. Fascinating. What a great about. response. And I'm sure with leaders at, like you at the top, you'll make life much easier for the younger women leaders who are now coming in. My, my next question for you, Joan, is that how do you foster a culture of continuous learning and development uh, within organizations that you work with? Huh. So that question is a little bit tricky for me because at this point I have my own consulting firm and I have to confess that I only work with organizations which understand the importance hmm. of continuous learning and development. Right. The fact that they've reached out to me says that they're already in that position. Hmm. So I guess I, I should say I'm a bit spoiled hmm. in that regard because I don't have to stimulate that awareness my clients come to me with the awareness already. Mm. And the, my role then is to help them to figure out what's the best path for you, for your people, in mm. terms of pouring into them, investing into them, and their professional and personal mm. development. Mm. Well said. You also uh, had a non-resident diplomatic stint. So my question is, how did your human resources background influence your diplomatic role, especially in the Latin American countries? Great question. So you would have mentioned before that I served in the administration of Dr. Winston Baldwin Spencer. Um, he was the leader of the United Progressive Party in Antigua and Barbuda. And our party had a people first leadership philosophy. Mm. So servant leadership was what our party believed in and putting people at the center mm -hmm. of development. And so it was because of my active role in HR in Antigua and Barbuda that mm -hmm. I was invited to join the administration and the prime minister specifically said mm -hmm. he was looking for someone who would always remain focused mm -hmm. on the people aspect of it. So in all my interactions with the assigned Latin American countries, mm. the focus was always on how can we put people at the center of every initiative, mm. whether it was a trade agreement, an energy agreement, scholarships. The focus was always, will this initiative improve the quality of life of the people that I'm representing? Mm. And so that's how I was able to bring HR to the table and ensure that at all times, people were first. Amazing, thank you. You're also a coach, Joan. So how do you approach coaching individuals and teams to navigate change successfully, given your certific certification as a certified change practitioner? Yeah. So, you know, you, most of your listeners have probably heard the statistics from McKinsey that says that 70% of change initiatives fail. Mm -hmm. Unfortunately, we usually state that statistic and then stop. Mm -hmm. McKinsey also went on to say why most of those change initiatives fail. Mm -hmm. And it's not generally because of the project management aspect of the change, mm -hmm. but rather it usually links back to a failure to adequately address the people side of change. Mm -hmm. And so in my work as a change practitioner, in my work as 
um, someone who coaches leaders. Mm. Whenever they're leading change, they're navigating change, I encourage them to remember the people side of change. Mm. Because, you know, there's a saying that people resist change. Mm. But a counter um, perspective to that is that people don't resist change. People resist being changed mm. because they are dealt with as objects of the change. Mm. rather than being involved in helping to craft the change in terms of executing the change. Mm. And so I'm particularly fond of the ADCAR model of change from ProSAD. And this is very people-focused, in addition to taking care of the project mm. management aspect. Mm. And the ADCAR is an acronym. It stands for awareness. So first you create the awareness Right. The need for change, mm -hmm. the why, Simon Sinek's work, start with why is so mm -hmm. important. So don't try and push change through unless your people understand why. What's at stake here? What's the risk of not changing? What are the consequences if we don't change? What are the opportunities if we do? Mm -hmm. So start with awareness. Then from awareness, you work to create a desire. Because just because I know intellectually why, Mm -hmm. We need to change. That doesn't mean I have a desire to be a part of the change. Right. And to create a genuine desire for change, mm -hmm. it can't be a one-size-fits-all approach. You have to know and understand your people mm -hmm. so that you can tap into their inner motivation and leverage that to create the desire to be a part of the change. Mm -hmm. Only after you have awareness and desire should you then proceed to where people tend to start. Mm -hmm. which is creating the knowledge of how to train. So the first time your people hear about the change is often when you tell them, okay, you need to go to training to learn how to do this. Mm -hmm. Why am I doing this? Why should I even be involved in this? Yep. So the knowledge comes after the awareness and the desire. Mm -hmm. Another thing we do that can cause change initiatives to fail is that we don't create an enabling environment. So we may have, we are pushing our people to change they don't have the equipment. They don't have the other resources. They don't have a supportive management team to effect the change. So creating the ability to change, not just within the individual, but within the environment. Mm. And finally, how do we reinforce change so we don't revert to business as usual? Mm. So the ADCAR model is something that I use whether I'm coaching individuals or I'm working with organizations in terms of helping them to take a, the organization to a major change initiative. Mm -hmm. Well said. So one more question, and then I wanted to move to your book. Since my conversation is, you know, my podcast is heard by a lot of very, very young people, my question to you is what advice would you have for young HR professionals aspiring to become leaders in their field based on your own journey? Huh. All right, for anyone aspiring to be a, a leader, I would say that it's very important, first of all, for you to ensure that you do the hard and necessary work to inspire confidence in others. Because mm. you can only lead if people are willing to follow you. Correct. Why should people follow you? Mm. So you need to establish your credibility in, and to ensure that you do the hard and necessary work to be the best at your craft. Mm. So you need to invest your time, your energy in doing the studies, in doing the work that you need to ensure that you truly bring value to the table. Mm. If you want to lead others, you have to show that you care for others. Yes, there are leaders. History will tell us about them who did not care. But what type of leader do you want to be? Is that the type of leader you want to emulate? Mm -hmm. Or do you want to show up in a way that um, tells that you truly care about the people that you're asking to work with you? And I, I say in the book that I have managed where I had compliance. I have led teams where I had compliance mm. and I've led teams where I had commitment. Mm. And I'll take commitment any and day of the week over well compliance. Said. Well said. And for people to be committed in you, they have to believe in you and they have to believe in the vision mm. that you are asking them to pursue. Well said. Great response. So let's talk about your book, uh, 
manager's first aid kit, which is a practical guide to remedy the three most common managerial challenges. Tell me about your book and the three common managerial challenges. All right. So what we have recovered is that my first career was actually in healthcare. Mm -hmm. So I came up through the science with the sciences and I was a laboratory technician. So the medical field and the metaphors and the jargons, I use them a lot in my work today. Mm. And when you think of a first aid kit, it's something that's recommended that we all have in our homes and in our business places so that if there's an injury, something goes wrong, you can take care of small problems before they become big problems. Mm -hmm. And so I use that metaphor in terms of my book. This is a tool that will help either current or aspiring managers to address the challenges before they become so big that they need to be hospitalized for right. them. Right. So that's the metaphor that we're using. What mm. are the three most common challenges? My own journey, as well as my work as a consultant as a, and as a coach, has led me to the conclusion that we can put the challenges in three main buckets. Mm -hmm. The first associated with managing self. Right. Because if you're to be effective, it, it begins with you, your level of self-awareness, your self-regulation, how mm. you show up. Right. And this um, harkens back to what I mentioned first mm. in terms of inspiring, having credibility as mm. a leader. So that's the first challenge. How do you manage self effectively? Mm. Mm. And then leadership is about getting things done with and through others. Mm. So having mastered managing self, how are you going to manage others? So that, that's the second challenge, managing others. And then the third challenge you now is that people operate within systems. So how do you manage systems and processes? Mm. So those are the three segments of the book, managing self, managing others, and managing systems and processes. Very interesting. And on that note, Joan, and your three wonderful managerial challenges, which you spoke about, managing self, managing others, and managing systems and processes. Thank you so much for speaking to me about your own amazing journey. Thank you for speaking to me about so many different aspects of human resources. I think I learned some new things from you today. Thank you also for being able for drawing so many lessons from your HR career to how you were able to use that those learnings both as a diplomat and in the office of the Honorable Prime Minister. Thank you for speaking to me and good luck to you. Thank you so very much, Tash. It's been a pleasure. Thank you for listening to the brand called You Videocast and Podcast, a platform that brings you knowledge, experience and wisdom of hundreds of successful individuals from around the world. Do visit our website www.tbcy.in to watch and listen to the stories of many more individuals. You can also follow us on YouTube, Facebook, Instagram and Twitter. Just search for the brand called You.